We can almost start our program. I'll just check with our guest speaker. I think he hasn't joined. Uh, once he's in, I think we can start our program. Our esteemed resource person, Professor Margaret, is already here. Uh, so I'll just... Okay, uh, we have Dr. Sangha as well. Um, we have asked most of our students to join uh, the YouTube live stream uh, so that more participants from outside um, can join this Zoom uh, link. Uh, I think we will be able to start our program now. Uh, I, I will be posting the YouTube link here in the chat box as well. Uh, so for those who are interested, you can share this link as well. <clears throat> a very good afternoon once again to our esteemed resource person for today, Professor Margaret L. Patswal, and our invited guest, Dr. Lel Munsanga, uh, um, and all our participants who are joining us through Zoom and YouTube Live. Today, on behalf of the Department of English and Women's Cell Government Statship College, we once again extend a very warm welcome, and we assure that our talk today and our discussions will be uh, as powerful and as beneficial uh, like our two previous sessions. So it is with great fervor that we present once again two astonishing personalities, Professor Margaret L. Patwa, who will be speaking on the topic, the cultural dynamics of gender um, in select Mizo narratives, and Dr. Lal Nunsa Ngaralte, who will be taking up the discussion session and add his ideas and views on the topic. I ensure that, uh, as I've already mentioned before, our talk today will be as profitable and uh, as fruitful as the ones we have had before. So I invite everyone to stay on till the, uh, till the end of the program. Now we shall now call upon our esteemed speaker, Professor Margaret L. Patswal, who is currently working in the Department of English, Mizoram University. Uh, to the students and scholars uh, she has taught, the name Professor Margaret uh, stands for professionalism, uh, expertise, dedication, and high standard. Uh, and it is apparent that this short introduction will not do justice to the name she has made for herself as an excellent academic and a prolific writer. And of the many achievements and contributions she has made in the academic world, I would just like to mention that as Mizos, we are extremely uh, we are extremely proud of her great translations that have made Mizo writers uh, who are writing in Mizo reach a larger audience and make our Mizo literature accessible to the you know to the larger world world through her exceptional translations. And uh, she's truly a great example to follow. Someone who keeps the ball rolling and would keep on achieving and contributing more to the literary, to the literary world. Um, I have seen her curriculum vitae. I cannot mention everything that is written there. It is no joke. Uh, she has undertaken three very powerful and uh, 
impressive individual uh, research projects under UGC. She has published a good number of articles in many acclaimed journals. Uh, she has contributed chapters in books. She has authored books herself. She has also edited books. And uh, she has presented a number of excellent papers in national and international seminars and conferences and have been invited uh, countless times as a resource person. Um, and as I've mentioned before, she has also translated numerous works from uh, Mizo to English that have been published by uh, renowned publishers, and some of them are included in our syllabus. Um, I would like to remind our students that Madam is the translator of um, um, many Mizo short stories that are in our syllabus, uh, to mention a few, Lali, um, which we have studied, uh, Tsingpui and Sielton Official. So although there is many to add, um, I will end this introduction uh, by saying that um, we are very grateful and indebted to have Professor Margaret L. Patrol to grace us to, in our humble you know, platform uh, today. And uh, we will now invite her um, to give her talk on the cultural dynamics of gender in Mizo, in select Mizo narratives. Well, thank you very much at the very outset, uh, Dr. Lalritsani. Uh, Ma'am, I think you have muted yourself. Am I audible? Uh, no, ma'am, I cannot hear you. Let me just check. Uh, you've still muted yourself. Uh, can you see? Uh, it's. I, I think I've just been unmuted. Uh, am I audible? Uh, Rinsan, I think. Uh, okay, okay, I think it, that that's a problem from my side. Yes, yes. Is it? Yes. We can hear you, ma'am. Yes, you are. Now? You are. You yes, are, you are. Yeah, so sorry. All right. Okay. All right. Ah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, and trust these things to happen. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dr. Rinsani, for that very, very uh, generous introduction. I don't think I deserve that, and uh, because uh, I think that was way, way too generous. And at the very outset, I would like to uh, thank uh, Government Sersip College for having invited me, the Department of English, and also subsequently, as Dr. Rintani has said, uh, the Women's Cell uh, to, for having hosted this talk and so for having had me at this point of time. Always a pleasure and a privilege. And uh, Dr. Rinsani had asked me to prepare a short PowerPoint. I think I'll be able to share that. At, uh, and it's a very short PowerPoint and perhaps we could just go on to that. And uh, I think I'll have something like 40 minutes, isn't it, Dr. Rinsani? Yes, and then after yes, that, the rest of the time. In fact, on. the whole afternoon, as long as the participants are able to joke. Okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, so, uh, let me try and do this. Mm. As mentioned, uh, as mentioned earlier, Rinsan, I cannot share it. It says that I have been disabled from screen sharing. It's all right. Wait, wait, ma'am, ma'am, please try again. Okay, uh, just a minute. Okay, is that fine? Yes, yes. All right, okay. Now, um, as mentioned uh, earlier uh, by Dr. Rintani, the topic of my uh, talk for today is called the cultural dynamics of gender in select Mizo narratives. And uh, I hope that uh, I will do at least a semblance of justice to the title that I have been, uh, I found it, you know, very daunting when uh, Dr. Rintani had uh, approached me with regards to this. And I'm just hoping that I'll do a smattering of justice at least to, you know, what has been written over here. I'll just start off with a very, very brief definition by WHO. Uh, I know that this is the third day of the program and I know that they've been two very, very uh, 
esteemed speakers before me, whom I'm sure have done a lot of justice to this entire uh, program, basically. So I'm not going to go into the logistics of gender, gender per se, but I'll just start off with the, this, that, uh, where, you know, the WHO, where the definition comes as uh, that very basic definition that we have, the char characteristics of women, men, girls, and boys that are socially constructed. So that particular paradigm of social construction is what uh, I would also like to base myself on this afternoon. And uh, this includes norms, behaviors, roles associated with being a woman or a man or a girl or a boy, relationships with each other. So man, woman, girl, boy, and also, you know, various other genders in between. So, but this is uh, not my definition, like I said, but this is the WHO definition of gender. And uh, as a social construct, gender varies from society to society and, and can change over time. So <clears throat> this becomes, um, that uh, you know, simplistic yet hopefully the universal construct that we have, and I know that uh, you know there would obviously be many many loopholes in between. But today my focus is generally going to be on the aspects that we have in terms of Mizo society, and particularly in terms of the literary representation that we have. Uh, I will start with uh, gender in terms of the uh, Mizo narratives out over here, where. Uh, I start with uh, the pre-colonial narratives. And what I like about, you know, the notion of gender, and especially in terms of uh, the pre-colonial, is that, uh, you know, what we have in Mizo narratives is something which I find uh, extremely fascinating because uh, I don't know if uh, the participants will share this with me, but we could do that later on when we have a discussion perhaps. But, you know, in orality, uh, that is in terms of the pre-colonial and even to a great extent in terms of, uh, you know, the colonial, we have, uh, I am going to pick up on, you know, certain narratives that we have in terms of our na narrative tradition out over here. We have had the dimensions in which, you know, uh, uh, gender per se has been projected by, uh, you know, misos as such. And as we know, the oral tradition is obviously something that comes before the written. I mean, you know, it doesn't take us rocket science to uh, denote that, you know, uh, the oral came before the uh, written. But what is important about, uh, you know, the oral tradition is that I always find it fascinating, uh, not just when I translate, but when I write also. And sometimes I get to teach this, uh, uh, you know, uh, the orality, I mean, the oral narratives. and. What I find fascinating is that uh, most of the time, uh, especially in today's world, we are always under the uh, notion, especially within, uh, say, Mizo society, that, uh, and I would love it if, you know, people would argue back on this particular point, is that, you know, we've always been such a patriarchal, uh, parochial kind of a society. And therefore, you know, that construct, that social construct that we have about gender is something that has come, you know, way, way back. And today, you know, when we talk about uh, concepts which are related to gender, gender per se, we're always talking about hopping back on how, you know, it's uh, especially in certain denominations in the church, it's parochial, it's patriarchal, we've got church elders, there's no place for, you know, women, stuff like that. So I'm going back to the very basics, and I find it extremely fascinating because, you know, we are always having these arguments, whether it is academic or non-academic, it always goes down to the notion of, you know, uh, our society has always been that women should be doing this and men should be doing this. There's a special, you know, orientation there for women and then a job orientation for men and so on and so forth. If we look at it in that very simplistic sense of the term, it actually sometimes feels that way. You know, that uh, it's always been so rooted. And because, you know, we always say things like, you know, women's, uh, women, uh, we've got these very, uh, you know, we've got these proverbs that say that, you know, the wisdom of a woman. Uh, and, you know, it's, we all know that, you know, uh, traditionally, basically, we always know that, you know, the wisdom of a woman is not something that ought not to go too far. And it's always been uh, almost as if to say that, you know, it's a given within the society, within that particular social construct. 
And uh, so we say things like, but you know, it's, it's difficult because you see it's always been this way. But you know, when we actually go back to the narrative tradition, and I'm, here I'm talking about the literary narrative tradition, I'm not going to uh, talk about any other narrative tradition, but here I'm going to talk about the literal aspects and starting off with orality, and also whatever that we could salvage in terms of, you know, the pre-colonial aspects, is that if you have a narrative, for example, like Thai Lungi, for instance, I don't know how many of us are familiar with this, but I think we will all know, uh, you know, for those of us, because obviously we, I don't, we don't have the time to tell each other the stories per se, but uh, we know that it's about this particular uh, child called Thai Lungi, uh, whom the, you know, whom this little uh, narrative is set upon, and she had a stepmother. And then again, you know, the whole concept about the stepmother becomes uh, extremely uh, significant because, uh, you know, if you talk about stepmothers, basically, it's always been that uh, stepmothers, not only in the Mizo paradigm, but, you know, uh, in the European and in the, uh, uh, the rest of Asia, if you do, you know, if you do folkloristics and if you do uh, that entire gamut of, say, children's literature also, you know that stepmothers have always been given this little, you know, that absolutely mean front, almost as if to say that if you're a stepmother, you have to be really bad and you have to be, you know, the big bad wolf out over there. I mean, or even maybe even worse than the big bad wolf sometimes. So we had this stepmother also in Thai Lungi. And this is basically the pre-colonial. And we had this stepmother who wanted to sell her to the traders from the boy community. And you know, today, if you actually talk about something like Thai Lungi, we will know that it's so much more complicated. I mean, you know, somebody from the boy community, it could have been for what? Could it have been for slave trade? Could it have been for flesh trade? Could what, Whatever could it have been for? But nevertheless, we're not going to speculate on that right now. But we told that she's got this stepmother who wanted to sell her to the traders from the boy community and uh, and, she, and in return for what? Scrap iron. And you know, the material culture therefore becomes very important that you actually feel that a daughter has to be relegated, uh, be, uh, you know, and you get your daughter, your stepdaughter out of the way. Why? Because you want to procure step, uh, scrap iron. But uh, that is what where you know. So you have the mother uh, met, meting out this treatment to a stepdaughter, all right? A stepmother meting out this treatment to a stepdaughter. But the important part is in that is in this last bullet point out over here is that in the story, what basically happens is that you have Thai Lungi's brother. So you know you've got this little uh, male. If you talk about the female and the male, if you talk about it in the stereotypical straight gender gender construct, you actually have the brother who wants to go in search of the sister. You know because the stepmother in the story keeps quiet about it, and she feels that nobody is going to notice. Of course, she knows that you know she's gone out, but she feels she's not going to be, you know, nobody's going to notice. But somebody notices, and that happens to be the little brother. So he keeps telling the mother, you know, he keeps asking, Oh, where is my sister? Where is my sister? And then she makes all the stepmother makes all these kind of excuses. But then what happens is ultimately we realize that you know she has to tell her where uh, the sister is. So ultimately, you know, he never gives up, he's got a lot of help you know, especially from the animal world order, and they help him and ultimately the little child is, the little girl is brought back and that too by the stepbrother, right? So, you know, in the functional dynamics, uh, you know, because obviously because it's orality and in the course of my research, when I have asked around and when I've gone to the archives, I have not been able to place, uh, there has not been anyone to, you know, help me to place a particular date or an era on Thai Lungi. But all we know is that, you know, you cannot, you actually have the little boy actually helping her out and in that particular pretext. And also the projection basically out over here that you have in terms of, uh, you know, Tsimta uh, Trota, uh, the male order out over here. Uh, you have Tsimta uh, Trota, 
uh, who has, I think uh, we all know the story. And Simtat Rotha obviously finds a very, very, you know, privileged place out here in terms of uh, textual narration. He's a person who's, uh, you know, he's a young man. He sets out on a hunt. And we all know the story of Tim Tatrota. You know, lump, uh, like it or lump it, you know, you have to live with Tim Tatrota as long as we are misos out over here. So he he sets off on a hunt and he stops to sharpen his dao along the length of a river. And then we are also told about the fact that it's a prawn who bites him on his testicles. And this becomes, you know, uh, this entire story about Tsem Tatrota is extremely fascinating because, uh, you know, this entire thing, you know, because when you go back to it, I always find it fascinating that, you know, to a certain extent, uh, uh, and because, you know, not too many studies obviously have been done on this particular front. I always find it fascinating that, uh, you know, you have uh, uh, people like uh, Tim Tatrota and being projected out over here as somebody, he's the male and he's, you know, he's out there with his Tao and he's sitting along the length of the river and, you know, he's probably humming to himself and, you know, feeling extremely macho. I mean, you know, that is what uh, the, the male at that point of time would have been told to do. But, you know, he's brought, he's like, he's totally humbled and uh, because there's this prawn who comes and bites him on his testicles. And it's important over here that, you know, for whatever reason, that there's this man who's been chosen to be, let's say, quote, unquote, the victim out over here. Okay. And uh, the prawn bites him on his testicles. And we know the rest of the story. You know, there's this whole lot, you know, why did you do this? And, you know, why did you do that? And, and then, you know, this is blame game, the whole thing, the whole tradition of the blame game, the Chinese whispers, you know, whatever that you want to call it in popular narrative uh, starts off with this man and not the woman. I find it interesting and I find that, you know, actually when you talk about meso narratives, it's always been very, very supportive and it's very, been very, you know, pro-gender centric in both ways. And, you know, so when you talk about the social construct and a paradigm, sometimes, you know, I, I feel that, uh, you know, you have to go back also to the basics, to whatever our beliefs are about our tradition, whatever that we think about our folklore. It's important that, you know, it's not just folklore, it's folkloristics. So you give that academic balance also to this whole narrative. It's also important that, you know, because uh, it's not a woman, you know, because, uh, you know, had a woman been there and they grabbed her breasts or, you know, uh, or whatever, then it would have, you know, people would have said, oh, my goodness, it's been so sexist. But here you actually have Tim Tatrota out over here, sexist also in that particular point, but it takes on a very, very significant dimension. And the whole thing about the Chinese whispers, whatever you want to call it, you know, the blame game out over here, you know, he did it and she did it and, you know, and ultimately, you know, how it ended. It, it all starts off and nobody says things like, oh, you know, it's only um, women who do this. And I've always been very supportive and I, you know, I uh, uh, thank if, if ever the prawn had you know, a whole generation to thank, a whole generation and a whole lot of descendants, I would be lining up to thank that particular prawn because he chose to bite Tim Tatrota because I think that he's given gender a very different kind of a paradigm out over here. Because you see, uh, I would like to over here, I would, what I would like to share over here is a particular uh, anecdote. And this is something that actually happened because I had gone once for a seminar uh, in Delhi and, uh, um, and uh, we were, to, uh, this, uh, the speaker out over there uh, said that, you know, uh, she had been to a particular house where there was a painting. And uh, it was about and uh, the painting and the the person who had painted that the uh, the artist was a very very uh, famous uh, uh, activist uh, and uh, obviously a woman, and uh, she painted that and she had uh, and there was this there were women and they were drawing water from a well, and uh, the name of that particular painting was called Women's Gossip. And she asked her, that woman, the artist, and she said, you know, had it been men out over here, what would you have named it? And without any ado, uh, that the artist said, I would have called it men's conversation. 
So you see, uh, there's all thing about you know what what is conversation, what exactly is gossip is also something that emanates not just from males but also from the paradigm of the female also. And I'm talking about 20th century and something as recent as you know five years back. And uh, I think all of us would have lots and lots to say also for that matter. And we need not be apologetic. Men can speak, women can converse, men can gossip. I think that is the universal truth. And in Simta Trotha also, you actually have this whole thing, the blame game. You know, and Simta Trotha, see, this is uh, when you had, uh, you know, the notion of the Pasaltra coming, all right? Pasaltra and Pu, uh, you know, um, Ubuanga, in his dictionary, he calls it the brave and he's a warrior, a predator, all right? So you have that imagery. So Tsimta Trotha was actually not Pasaltra in that sense of the word, but yes, what I'm trying to say is he lived in that particular ethos. And, you know, he's out there, he's doing all this. And here you have the prawn biting him on his testicles and, of course, the blame game slowly but very, very steadily going along. We have um, also... Uh, one of my very favorite uh, narratives out over here is Remain Hoi. And I think most of us are again familiar with Remain Hoi, where you have this depiction of a very, very, you know, she's a beautiful damsel. And incidentally, what I must add out over here is that in Mizo narratives, especially orality, you have very few and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think all of us, I'm not trying to show off over here, but you must forgive me if I do once in a while, uh, you know, because of I'm, because I'm just trying to bring some element of authenticity to my talk. I've gone almost through the entire gamut of our folk tradition. And I have to say that, and maybe perhaps this is also something that you'll would observe, uh, you have very few narratives where you actually have um, the depiction of uh, uh, women in terms of their uh, physical aspect. Very, very few. Remain Hoi is one of those. Uh, you know, especially as compared to other literatures, say to the rest of India, the rest of Asia, Southeast Asia, European, American, you know, especially like, for example, if you have stories that talk about, um, you know, if you have stories that talk about, uh, say, Cinderella, all right, the, the Europe, in the European ethos, after she had been transformed and, you know, by her uh, fairy godmother with that wave of her wand, if you remember, she's so beautiful. We told about, you know, I mean, what, what would she look like, what she wore, right down to that very, very important glass slipper. We don't have too much of those if, and, uh, you know, and remain hoi. Her counterpart, perhaps in the European world, would actually be Rapunzel. I think we know the story about Rapunzel, and Rapunzel, as we know, is this really fine young woman, and she's got, you know, her golden locks of hair. And, uh, of course, in this particular case, Rimen Hoi happens to be a married woman. And, you know, there's this local chief who's, uh, who ha sets his heart on her, not, and again, this is interesting because it's not because he finds her beautiful, but it's actually because he feels that, you know, because of her locks of hair, when she washes her hair in the uh, uh, river, she's, uh, as she's bathing, it, uh, you know, it, it's washed down the river, it, it goes downstream. And then, you know, we know that, you know, there's this uh, fish who swallows that and, you know, it's so he, uh, you know, the fish becomes really big and fat. And then, you know, then they produce that lock of hair. And so he is under the impression that whoever gets to have, you know, such long hair ought to be really beautiful. I mean, uh, you know, it's actually very, very illogical. It, it doesn't make any logic, but well, uh, this is folklore and perhaps obviously based on some element of lore out over there. In this particular case, it's actually a woman that he falls for. And then we know what happens, you know, the husband comes back and then he, she's rescued end of the story. Uh, in this particular case, of course, is uh, her fine long hair. Other than that, you do not have, even if you go through, you know, the varying narratives that you have in orality about Rimen Hoi, there is not much that tells you about her physique, the features that she had and, you know, uh, how tall she was or how short she was, nothing of that sort. But that description about that very, very fine long hair in terms of the aesthetics 
And yes, very importantly, the man, the husband goes and, you know, he gets to rescue her. You know, this is one of the where you have, uh, you know, a tradition. It's not just, uh, you know, it's not just uh, you can't just say things like, oh, you know, this is a chance for the males to show off. And, uh, you know, and so therefore they are, you know, they get to uh, uh, go and rescue the women, you know, because it's the, the haplessness of the women. It's nothing of that sort. It's basically that, you know, it's a community. It was a community. We have lived in a community that would have been extremely, extremely supportive. And if the Basaltra was out on a hunt, it was basically so that he could feed and he could come back and he could provide for, well, the community and especially his own hamlet. It was as important as that. And if the man was, let's say, pompous, okay, quote, unquote, again, I'm making my air quotes out over here, pompous enough to say something like, you know, uh, uh, telling the woman, telling his wife uh, uh, that, you know, uh, whatever was there, the broth that she was uh, making out there uh, by the fire was actually um, uh, uh, getting out of hand, then what happens is, that it was actually because there were very, very different kinds of parameters that were being set for the male and for the female. For the male, he was somebody who provided. And, and as for the women, you know, her domain basically was that of the house. And so therefore, you know, that demarcation worked beautifully together. And it wasn't, you know, oppression or uh, suppression at any point of time. So we can, uh, this is my reading into it, we could always argue and debate and uh, facilitate out over there. Uh, coming back to uh, something which is um, one of the, it, this is singularly that one representation that we have in Mizo folklore, which is very, very close to, a, let's say, a mythical, a very traditional and, you know, a typically mythical kind of a representation. We do have other myths, but nothing as profound as this, at least like I'm saying, once again, over here in my reading of the story, we all know who Tsong Tzili is. And uh, there is this courtship that you have, between a young damsel and also a serpent. And then of course, uh, obviously the liaison would not have been encouraged in the family. So they try to keep it a secret. And finally, of course, we realize that, you know, the serpent was killed by the father. And uh, by this time, of course, Tsong Tzili is pregnant and she's, uh, because, and she refuses to give up her liaison with the snake. So what happens out over here is that, uh, you know, we've got this particular, uh, uh, you know, we've got this particular representation of, uh, you know, females having been, uh, you know, there's a lot that has been done to them. Like I said, in terms of Tai Lungi, somebody who's, be, who's got a stepmother who would be willing to basically uh, sell her to a boy community. And you know, the boys were actually foreigners and, uh, uh, and especially at that point of time and people who they actually looked down upon they were a merchant class, but they were actually people who were looked down upon. And, you know, so you sell her for what? I mean, you know, for scrap iron, basically, so that perhaps you could have a better life. And then you go on to, you know, the other stories that I have basically narrated also, uh, and which are, you know, the representation that you have of both the male and the female, you know, where you have, uh, say, supportive males at a particular point of time. And also the depiction also of the male in uh, Mizo narratives at, in terms of orality, where, you know, you don't just have one particular gender being uh, given, um, given uh, uh, you know, significance, basically. Uh, so what happens out over here is that, uh, you know, uh, due to the advent of uh, uh, religion, and as we know, a lot of our uh, archival aspects have been uh, uh, done away with. So many of them, many of these tales, like I have said, have been uh, relegated as relics of a, what you call a non-Christian past. And therefore, uh, sometimes you feel that, uh, you know, sometimes you just feel that uh, they have little or no references to the notion of identity. But my, you know, and uh, I'm now coming, I'm trying now to coming to, I'm trying to come now to the, uh, the, you know, the second half of my talk, which is about uh, the, the the colonial the post colonial where I would basically uh, reiterate that uh, you know uh, 
the position basically of the male as well as the female out over here. Now, um, what they're trying to say over here, and I'll try and conclude with this in terms of the colonial and the pre-colonial aspect that is in terms of uh, uh, folklore is that, uh, you know, many, many times we feel that, uh, you know, you don't have, uh, uh, these are references which have, which do not have, these are tales, which do not have references to the notion of meso-identity. So what happens out over here is that, uh, People feel that these are things which ought to be just relegated uh, over the hood, kept atop the fire shelf, and we, we, and it would basically not have any uh, significance, basically. But my point over here is that you know you can actually use these as cultural parameters. More should be documented in any form. And so that uh, they can be favorably uh, considered, especially as we are trying to embark upon very, very important aspects like gender. Then uh, what we have over here is um, in the post-colonial ethos, uh, folk uh, narrative remains today. And uh, we have myths within the ambit of a pre-colonial culture, like I have said, and also, uh, you have misomit, you also have folkloristics also, and these have been, like I said, uh, coherent representations of the uh, parameters. And uh, very quickly out over here, before I come to the post-colonial, how the concept of creation, for example, has been portrayed. That is, again, very different in terms of the uh, creation of the of the. Mid, uh, creation aspects of the post-colonial era. We know that, uh, you know, in the pre-colonial era, especially, you actually had uh, a, a female goddess, uh, somebody called Kwasi Nu, and she was actually responsible for the creation of this entire earth and everything that is in it. So she was basically responsible. So there was a lot of, you know, uh, there was a lot of, um, importance that was actually given to the female goddess, the goddess of creation. This is again, obviously, in sharp contrast to the post-colonial era, because you have the Christian God there, and the Christian God is obviously male. And the creation aspect also of, you know, uh, how everything was created within, uh, you know, that span of a week, that has been done by the male. So uh, what I'm trying to say out over here is that, you know, when we have to, uh, when we talk about uh, dynamics in terms of gender, gender per se, it is important to understand that, uh, you know, there a whole lot of uh, that paradigm shift obviously comes and you can you have to study it and you have to talk about it from a colonial uh, there is a difference in terms of a colonial slant as well as also in terms of the post-colonial aspect uh, here I won't go too much into this we're talking about the bible in the book of genesis and in the Old Testament also, where you see other aspects of creation. Then uh, decades after, in 1894, for example, you have, uh, you know, a sharp new perspective that basically uh, came into being, especially when, you know, you try to overthrow one particular element of culture, that is orality, and get it back to your gender dynamics, okay? Uh, this is something that I will quickly go on too, because I think I'm running slightly out of time, the post-colonial. I'm going to talk about uh, narratives by uh, Elbia Kliana, uh, Lali, as Dr. Uh, Rinsani had introduced earlier, Si Tuam Loya, Sheldon Official, Ka Player, Tsim Pui, and also Van Ne Tuanga, the jackfruit tree, which was originally on uh, 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 written as Lam Kuang. I'm going to focus here very, very briefly each on the treatment of women by men, the projection of women by the male writers and also the male perspective in the text because we all have to remember that gender is both male, it is also female. And in this particular light also, uh, there is this program, I think, which is there in every college by now. I don't know whether it would be functional, but, you know, uh, uh, the recommendation was that the UGC had, and this was about six years ago, had this program called Gender Champions. And uh, so gender champions becomes very important because you see, especially the whole of India, you know, when you talk about gender, everyone thinks it's all about women. 
And, you know, when you talk about the gender self, for that matter, everything, everyone feels has to be, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, somebody has to be there who is a woman and they have to be women in that particular community, so on and so forth. Uh, I was, uh, I, and I had been a nodal officer when, um, along with a colleague of mine for gender champions, it was our job especially to tell everyone, including faculty members, that gender is actually very, very all-encompassing. It's male, it is female. So which is why today I have purposely chosen these particular narratives, not just because I have translated them, but because these have been a seminal, especially Piakliana, Tuam Loya, and also Kaklia. These have been a seminal novelist. They've been the wheels of the Mizo novel, as they were called. And Van Ikwanga needs no introduction, basically. Uh, he's, uh, you know, he's several generations behind. The first three writers out over here, very quickly out over here, are writers who were in the first, who were there, seminal writers, unfortunately did not have too much of a purpose because unfortunately they did not live too long, but whatever they wrote was extremely significant in terms of contribution to the cultural dynamics, especially in terms of gender. And these were writers who came in the first half of the uh, 20th century, and also died at that point of time, unfortunately. Very, very learned, very, very erudite. People who, you know, even if they had existed now and were writing, we would have been extremely, not only us, but the entire world would have been totally proud of them and also their contribution. We all know these particular tales. So I'm not going to go into, uh, you know, what ha what's happening uh, from right from uh, A to Z, but, uh, you know, the kind of these, the men, uh, see, if you look at uh, Lali, a male writing about this particular woman and making the woman the protagonist out over here, see, Tuam Loya, Sialton official, is actually about the male, about this person who is known as the Sialton official. But it's actually also about, you know, Dorothy, as we know. And Dorothy, the liaison between him and Dorothy, remember, he, he even cries out and he says, you know, he says, Dorothy, queen of the days I love. And, you know, the manner in which uh, both genders can actually come to so much of anguish and anxiety uh, and, you know, so, when so much of trauma uh, is inflicted on both. So you can't say things like, you know, so, so what I find so beautiful about these narratives and Kaplia's Tsingpui, of course, which has this beautiful amalgamation of the culture and where Tsingpui was this, who we're told is extremely beautiful. We just told she's extremely beautiful, mind you, but you know, uh, in terms of the greater details, we don't have too much. So, and how, you know, ultimately she's beheaded. And Van Le Tuang, the jackfruit tree, or Lang Kuang, where you basically have this entire concept about uh, this man called and Padaya is a man who's an alcoholic. He's a raving, rip roaring alcoholic. There's not a time in the story where he's not drunk. I'm just going to tell you all a little bit about this because I think the first three we all have, are familiar with, uh, th thanks to the syllabus. But, uh, you know, he's this, and this particular man is called Padaya. He's so totally, you know, he's drunk. And uh, and there is this woman out over here, and uh, we know her as Nonovi. And what happens is she's in love with him. And she happens to be the daughter of the woman whom he used to go to to buy his drinks. And she falls in love with him. And she's supposedly very beautiful and she's nice looking and she's smart and everything. And uh, uh, Padaya says he totally refuses. And the reason as to why he refuses is not because uh, he doesn't like her or because he's married and he says, you know, it's only one woman for me for the rest of my life. It's nothing of that sort. It's basically because, you know, he says something that's very significant. And he says, I'm totally a nobody. Look at me. I'm drunk. I, you know, and look at you. So it's more in terms to, uh, you know, of that, you know, in today's terms, if you look at it, it would be more in terms of the man having this extreme inferiority complex and telling the woman, look, you know, you're right up there and I'm here. And to top it all, you know, apart from the fact that I don't have a job and I'm not too great looking and anything of that sort, you know, I'm, you're like so much better. So she, 
you know, he refuses her on that ground. He tries to do, you know, he, he gives it some element of justice by saying that, you know, you deserve someone better. And I, I totally champion Padaya out over here because, you know, in a world where we have so many wannabes, you know, we say things like, oh, you know, people marry for money, and, you know, and that's for both genders, right? I mean, for the male, for the female, and well, if they marry for money, well, uh, you know, it's their story. So no comments on that particular front, but this man out over here, Padaya, he actually said, you know, he didn't want to marry for anything, but, you know, but real reasons, basically, and especially to Nonobi, he said, you'll find somebody better. She gets very upset. She gets really upset. She can't understand why. Whereas, you know, Padaya, according to me, especially in a post-colonial Mizo narrative ethos, uh, amongst the protagonists that I have read, Padaya, I think, is the one protagonist who basically is not merely honest, but seems to understand the true dynamics of love out over here. And so ultimately what happens is, you know, the woman also, Nonovi, she's somebody who's very, very, very spirited. And, you know, she's not, she's got this never say die kind of a spirit. And that's been portrayed very well by the writer. And you know what she does is she ultimately what happens is she's, uh, she has to get married. And then ultimately, she obviously does not find uh, any uh, happiness in that particular marriage because, you know, her heart goes out to Padaya and she's given her, uh, him her heart and soul. And so, you know, and then she turns into a prostitute. And then what happens out over here is, you know, she dies of AIDS. And, you know, it's almost as if to say that uh, the author uh, gives, uh, you know, inflicts her with uh, this particular uh, female protagonist with AIDS. It almost as if to say that, you know, it was that particular stamp of authority that said, well, you know, this is basically because of unrequited love, failed love, whatever that you could call it. But my point over here is uh, the jackfruit tree is a very significant portrayal of 20th century. Uh, I'm not saying that they are the only portrayal out over here, but it's a very, very significant portrayal of, uh, you know, the, the female, the male and the female uh, aspects uh, of the relationship and also the character and the personality that you find in uh, uh, male and female, basically, out over here in post-colonial Mizo ethos. And when I entered this particular story for uh, fiction in translation, and when it won the first prize, it was actually recommended because they said that it was something that actually portrayed the inherent cultural ethos of the, uh, you know, of that of a particular culture. So in this particular case, the Mizo. Now, your, the portrayal, the, the dynamics of, uh, you know, the cultural dynamics that you have representing male and female, as opposed to say, Tsing Puyi, the portrayal was obviously very, very different because it's a different ethos altogether. You've got this woman out over here and she's beheaded. There is a loyalty factor also out over here. You also have, uh, uh, you know, you have Biak Tuanga, who was the one true love that she had. And ultimately, of course, you know, her debt. Uh, why it obviously had to end in debt is, uh, and especially in the jackfruit tree, is another dimension altogether. But yes, you do have very strong men, very strong women portrayed out over there as far as the ethos is concerned. You also have uh, in Shelton official, Dorothy, you, you know, um, you, the Shelton official could not get married to Dorothy. That was clear. You know, you can't get married to her, but yes, you get married to someone else. You try to make it work. Suddenly you realize you cannot make it work. Biak Liana also in Lali, you know, the kind of treatment that was meted out to Lali and also to her mother and also subsequently to, you know, her best friend. Uh, the manner in which they were so busy and the manner in which, you know, the, uh, the father, her, Lali's father actually was uh, an alcoholic. He was, uh, the rest of the family had converted to Christianity. He was non-Christian. The kind of treatment that was actually given by Biak Liana to the male protagonist, you know, that's Lali's uh, father out over here, is also something which is in a way commendable because you could always say that, you know, it could have been this, it could have been the other gender, it could have been this. Now, I understand also that, you know, there are many um, 
there are many stories or there would be obviously in today's world it's a changing ethos i'm not disputing that but we have always been i think very honest and we've been always very you know uh, pivotal in terms of uh, you know portraying uh, nuances regarded uh, uh, in terms of gender to both the male as well as to the female. So the situatedness that I had started with, the definition that I had started with, the social aspect and the culture and the situatedness that you have of from that coming from certain communities is something that is also, um, you know, something that we have to look at also or re-look at, re-situate perhaps. I will end over here by, you know, just, uh, talking about uh, two narratives over here where a couple of narratives um, where uh, one is uh, uh, about this particular character cor, uh, called uh, Cordumbela. I don't know if we are familiar with this tale, but I'll just read out one line and it's the line that comes right at the beginning. And it starts by saying, Cordumbela was a very ugly man. And I like the way that, you know, our culture celebrates the fact that, I don't know, like I said, you know, uh, there are, there are uh, narratives that we have about beautiful women also, and perhaps about handsome men, but you don't have the description in detail. So could it be that, you know, uh, in terms of a gender construct for both, both ways, we were never really, you know, good looking? Should we thank you know, uh, the, uh, the makeup industry for, you know, bequeathing us with so-called good looks at this point of time, but we're celebrating, you know, almost as if to say that we're celebrating ugliness. Cordumbela was a very ugly man, all right? And then the rest of it is, the story is also about, you know, how ugly he is and almost as if to say, and then there is this other particular person called Sepahakata. And again, bang, you know, first sentence, Sepahakata was a very ugly man. And, you know, and it's very sad because, you know, it goes on to say that he was so ugly that no one wanted to marry him. And, you know, he... Uh, remained unmarried for many, many years. So it goes on in terms of that. We celebrate, and what I'm trying to say over here is that, you know, in terms of the Mizo narratives, uh, obviously, because at that point of time, we never thought about theory. We never thought that there would be something called post-structuralism and deconstruction that coming out. We never thought there would be gender studies and people would be attacking us left, right, and center. But because we were presenting things for whatever it was, I uh, find that it is fascinating to celebrate also the projection of gender in our culture, in our narratives, in terms of our, the orality, and especially also in uh, these particular tales that I have uh, spoken about. I don't know if uh, I have made too much sense but i just hope that a lot of it has not been nonsense and i will end with this and thank you very very much to government crc college for this wonderful wonderful opportunity thank you very much okay i think my connection was a little unstable there that was why i did not uh, hear uh, ma'am, her last words. But anyway, thank you so much, ma'am, for enriching us um, once again with your interesting, sometimes very witty and profound analysis on Mizo narratives. Um, I truly hope that uh, from your talk alone today, we realize the need to be more critical and investigative uh, when it comes to our own literature. Uh, so now to initiate the discussion, and add further comments, analysis, or thoughts on the topic, I would like to invite Dr. Lagnun Sang Arate, uh, more popularly known as uh, Sang Says or Poor Man's Poet on Instagram. I'm sure many of us have read his poetry or have listened to his reading of poetry. And I'm also convinced that uh, many of us are already a fan uh, after hearing him talk today. Uh, Dr. Sangha lives in Shillong, Meghalaya, where he works as an assistant professor uh, at Martin Luther Christian University. Uh, he's a member of Northeast Writers Forum and has participated in various literary events. His poems have been published in books, in magazines, and various online magazines. He was also part of the Poets Translating uh, Poets Project, organized by the Gotha Institute, Mumbai, and was invited to read his poems in a poetry festival in Germany. 
I would also like to add that uh, he has actively lent his voice on social media, uh, commenting and spreading awareness on social issues, especially on causes related to Mizo society. And I think uh, most of us, especially you know the younger generation or younger listeners today, um, are aware of the powerful impact that his heart-rending poems and comments uh, on the recent border clash between Mizoram and Assam have had, uh, especially in swaying the minds of the younger generations, as well as in reaching a larger audience. So I now call upon our poor man to come forward uh, with his rich analysis and take on the discussion with Professor Margaret and the audience. All right. Uh Okay, you, you're very generous with your <laughs> introductions and your compliments. Uh, okay, I'm not all of that, but uh, yes. <clears throat> I just wanted to begin by saying that, like, you know, this is an extreme honor for me, especially to share this with uh, uh, Professor Margaret El Pizzo. Uh Last year, what had happened was, I'll just, I'll just get to it, but I just wanted to say this, that last year, uh, uh, the Brahmaputra Literary Festival was going to happen. It's the biggest literary festival we have in the Northeast and they've been inviting authors from all over the world. Uh, so last year they wanted to do something that was a little bit more specific towards the Northeast. And when they asked me that they, they had asked me to be part of the uh, committee where we can plan panels and things like that. And when they asked me like who we should invite, I think uh, Ma uh, Professor Margaret El Pacho's name was the first one that I gave uh, to represent Mizoram because I think her work is quite uh, extensive, like you said, and very, very exemplary. So, <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to begin with that. But anyway, so uh, also I would like to thank uh, Nanui. Uh, sorry, I keep just calling you Nanui. I should be calling you Dr. Right. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and the Department of English Governments, their chief college, for inviting me to be a part of this. And honestly, I was hoping that like last year I would simply be uh, an attendee and maybe have one or two questions, and that's about it. <clears throat> there was a lot less pressure then. Uh, anyway, I've attended all uh, the days that you've had for this year, and I've found each one very enlightening and nodding in agreement to what has been discussed, uh, starting with, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Christina Zama and her thoughts on the LGBTQ and the idea of victimization. And then yesterday with uh, Ma'am Kritika, is it Dr. Kritika Sharma? I think uh, so, right? Not yet. Oh, not yeah. yet. Okay. And uh, soon to be Dr. V, uh, mm. Ma'am V. Lalma Swami as well, I think. Yes. And their talk on a specific feminist theory for India, and along with uh, Dr. Krishna Zama chipping in that we need uh, the need for constant discourse and sensitization at the local level, which is also what I want to talk about and completely agree on this localizing of universal social cultural movements and ideologies. Uh, so, and of course, coincidentally, or perhaps faithfully, once again, I'm here with Professor Margaret El Pachol. Uh, coincidentally, because last year too, when I attended, it was her that was speaking and she was speaking on translation. And faithfully, because like the two things that I want to talk about, like, you know, translation, uh, literature and culture, I think she's the perfect person to talk about with, for all of this. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, so when we're taking agency, when we take the, of course, we obviously have to take onus uh, or agency when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, making our own narratives now, uh, which is very important, which is why even with the border issue that you've uh, talked about so much where I've uh, always, always uh, tried to make sure that we, you know, you, we make our own narratives now. <clears throat> we create our own narratives now. Now, uh, just uh, so uh, along with what was being said yesterday again about the localizing of uh, universal social uh, social cultural movements, there's always this great danger. And even with the UN in their description of uh, uh, gender and indigenous tribes, they've also been very careful in saying that you know uh, it is not about uh, basically absorbing things into a bigger into the bigger whole, but you know, still keeping the uniqueness of each individual indigenous, indigenous tribe, yet having these uh, uh, these uh, ideologies of social equality, you know, uh, being brought to them and all of that. But I think like the onus is on us to be able to, to do this for ourselves as well. Uh, so I just want to talk about a few problems that uh, I, I may have observed uh, when it comes to uh, how to, to go about this. Now, firstly, it's the translation of theories and movements into the indigenous uh, lexicon. Please note that I didn't say language, all right? There's a way in which we, we Mizos adopt words from other languages into our everyday parlay, in which the word often changes from its original true meaning is somewhat about there, but 
takes a life of its own and its connotation, like confi, which example, which comes from confidence, and den, which comes from danger, right? So, ma'am, last year spoke about uh, that's ma'am Margaret, that is. She spoke last year about the difficulties of translation, and that besides just finding accurate words from the source to the target language, there is this uh, really daunting task of translating cultures, because words alone cannot truly translate meaning if we cannot translate the cultural weight and context of that word. So <clears throat> a short example, like, uh, how would I say, like CL, for example, if we translate it to a, another language, what would it be in English? Like a uh, bison, uh, buffalo, whatever it is. But the moment we translate it, it just becomes an animal. Somehow it does not carry the same weight that a CL carries to a Mizo person. Like, you know, it is as important as gold, so to speak, right? Because it carries that weight. So unless we're able to uh, translate that cultural importance, it is very, very difficult to, uh, to truly translate meaning. Uh, so a lot of the isms and the other words that have, ent uh, they have entered into our conversational languages, uh, the feminism and all of these things, they have, they have entered our conversational languages, but there seem to be a great disconnect in terms of understanding it, or more importantly, interna internalizing the, theory, uh, the history, weight, nuance, and connotations that they're supposed to carry. When we read uh, from books, articles, essays, and such from the West, they carry with them their own cultural factors, symbols, signifiers. And if we cannot translate these into ours, it will be very difficult to bridge that disconnect. Now, yesterday, uh, Ma'am V. Uh, Lalmal Somi, she spoke about the term Nutoy, and I've written a poem about it as well, and I've had other people other writers, I've seen them write about, you know, these uh, uh, social issues, but in, in, in a misocultural context. So the reaction that I've gotten from it, the feedback that I've gotten from it, I think, uh, so it's, it's a poem that speaks about my own mother's experience, and I'm using it to speak about gender equality and discrimination, but using the misocultural context. Here, the feedback I've received, it has been quite surprising to me, and also is quite revealing on how we can be more accepting of these ideologies when translated into our own cultural context since we can internalize it better, right? So that's the first thing that we, I, I feel that, that, that that's uh, the obstacle that awaits us and that we need to overcome, that cultural translation of it, more than just the words themselves, more than just the lexicon or the jargon itself. So <clears throat> uh, that's there. And from that, let me just take into literature, uh, though a lot of the, uh, some of the questions that I've, I have about this has been answered by uh, uh, Professor Margaret's uh, uh, presentation just now. But anyway, let me just ask it to, again, uh, <clears throat> emphasize the importance of literature in influencing society. So the thing is, like, I, I was always curious to know uh, how present uh, popular Mizo literature deals with these themes and these ideologies that we're talking about, uh, <clears throat> that we're talking about. Uh, is there now a deliberate attempt to engage in these ideologies? Are characters more rounded or still car or cardboardish, or are they still caricaturish and stereotypical, uh, specifically with women uh, characters? You know, using the same polarized tropes of either the evil stepmother or temptress, or the saintly, chaste, pristine embodiment of goodness and meekness, who's always a perpetual victim, damsel in distress, waiting to be saved by a man. Is it still there? But the thing is. Uh, Kim Palm Singh Nongkundri's poem, Blasphemous Lines for Mother, when it was first published, caused quite a stir. Now, uh, it, the poem spoke about, he, he wrote a poem about his mother, and he wasn't very complimentary, so to speak, in, in his description of her. And it caused quite a stir, especially among the more genteel women, because like in the poem, he wrote about how his mother would, you know, use really foul language to school her kids. Like, uh, uh, you know, stuff like sons of a vagina and all of that. So, you know, the more genteel crowd, the more, uh, what shall I say? I wouldn't even say westernized. I would say Victorianized, if that's a word. Uh, you know, society of, of that, the Burom class, they call it here. Uh, but anyway, so they were quite shocked by that. That They were like, oh, no, 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 women cannot talk like that. Women cannot speak like that. Women cannot be angry like that. Women cannot be violent like that. So th they were quite uh, uh, in shock uh, with uh, uh, Kim Palm's poem. However, it, it is, it is uh, ironic that, uh, you know, that they should be up against it because when you take a closer look at this particular uh, poem, Blasphemous Lines for Mother, firstly, it is a very, very accurate depiction 
of a very, very, uh, of a traditional, more traditional Khasi society in which they are very uh, passionate with their words. They're very expressive with their words, which is why they have a lot of, you know, what you call uh, uh, swears and uh, swearing and all those kinds of words, like, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and I've heard it myself as well when I was, uh, when, when I was little, but how mothers would scold them. And sometimes that foul language is the terms of endearment. So there's an honesty to it. There's a, there's a representation of reality to it. Uh, so that's the first thing. Now, secondly, what I wanted to talk about, uh, more importantly, in terms of like uh, gender and feminism, is the fact that I loved how Kim Palm refused to deify his mother. Like normally, when people, uh, when writers write about uh, either either the, the woman or, or or mothers or somebody that they love, they tend to glorify them, put them on pedestals, and and then uh, hold them to impossible standards. Like yesterday, when it was asked why the hypocrisy and judgment for the same act when committed by a man as opposed to by a woman, the truth is this: because of ideas like this of putting people on a pedestal, women on on, on pedestals, is the fact that. Men can get away with it by saying like, oh, we're just human beings and have flaws. But women are not allowed to have flaws because they're goddesses, right? So that is extremely, extremely harmful and it is dehumanizing as well. So he refused to deify her. Instead, he showed her as she is, flesh and blood with all her flaws and he made her human, right? Not a goddess, not a monster, but human. And in the end, he says that he wouldn't be who he was or who he is if she wasn't who he, she was, she was human. Therefore, she was able to make him who everything that he is today. So now this kind of literature with local cultural context, speaking on those, uh, you know, uh, wider universal social movements, are we getting there? Do you agree is important? And are we also getting there? That's the question that I want to ask and want to uh, discuss on. Okay, so the last point, I hope I'm taking a lot of time. I'm sorry, uh, just one more. Uh, <clears throat> The last one that I want to talk about, uh, about uh, the, uh, the problematic nature of uh, promoting these isms today in, uh, in the local context is the fact that uh, as technology, first of all, uh, technology where information is at the palm of our hands. And normally this technology, we're being fostered a lot of information, all right? So, however, a lot of this information is incomplete and lacks so much context and subtext. It is mostly reductive and sensationalistic and also doesn't account for difference in cultural maturity. I'm just putting that there. Uh, in, and this is uh, in continuation with what a, uh, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Cecil Tanmoya spoke about, uh, I think day before yesterday, right? He spoke about the leap we had to make as a society where we didn't really have the time to grow and mature gradually, but thrust into this global uh, village existence, running before learning to crawl, basically. So it feels like this also with our consumption of these ideologies and arguments. Now, a lot of the younger people are taken in by the popular, trendy intellectuals uh, who would, who, and their criticism of, say, something like feminism. Now, the arguments and critiques that these people have is of, 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 of a version of feminism, of, of, of a version of feminism that has grown, uh, uh, that, ha that, that has, of a version of feminism that has branched out into or grown into now, All right? The arguments and critiques themselves are never of the fundamental thoughts and essence of the ism itself, but more as to what it has become and grown into. Now, I'm not going to argue the validity of their arguments, but rather the fact that these arguments that they are making are being received as a criticism of the movement and discrediting the entire ideology itself. We are still at a stage where even just the first foundational ideas of the movement like feminism, feminism are starting to take shape and being implemented. Uh, but without even going to the un these understanding, we're listening to these critiques and, and you know finding that, oh, therefore it unsuits us and we feel validated by these intellectuals and, <clears throat> uh, and thereby we dismiss the ideology completely. Totally unaware that whatever freedoms, equality, and social justice we have is because of the same ideologies that we are reje rejecting. So without the chance to go through A, B, C, we are now listening to a criticism and a discussion on D and basically uh, and basically just dis and, and basically just accepting that being validated by the intellectuals and thereby dismissing the whole alphabet altogether. So that seems to be a problem, especially with the fact that of, of technology and listening to all these 
criticism now because like we are forgetting the cultural context, the cultural maturity, where they are, where we are, and, and those things. So uh, these are the problems that I personally foresee and uh, I think that it's worth discussing on. If I'm wrong, please tell me so. So yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Let me throw it back to Nanui and whoever wants to comment. Uh, Professor Margaret, would you like to comment further on uh, whatever uh, Dr. Sanger has said? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sanga and Dr. Nanavi. I was just wondering, uh, are there any other, uh, you know, uh, issues that ought to be addressed uh, so that if need be, then I could just take on the whole thing altogether? Or um, from from Dr. Sanga? No, not from Dr. Sanga, from okay, the uh, There are a few, yeah, there are a few questions that I have received. Would you prefer, uh, okay. Um, so how would okay, you prefer... So I, uh, should I just read one of the uh, one of the questions that I have received, uh, so that maybe we can first make a comment on that? Okay, sure. About Mizo folk tales, um, ma'am mentioned about the celebration of ugliness in Mizo folk tales. Do you think we can take into account the diversity of women's experiences and multiple collective and individual uses of beauty culture in reading Mizo folk tales? This is a this is one question. And do you think Mizo men's take on masculinity and the idea around what it is to be a man affects the way they perceive the beauty, the beauty culture? Example, in the context of the judgment they pass on Korean pop culture, the male artist, uh, they pass on Korean pop culture, the male artist. Uh, so that is, the, that is the question that I have received from uh, one of our valued participants. Uh, so is that clear enough, ma'am? Yes, Should yes. I read the question? I think I'll just try and answer it. And if perhaps it's not clear, then maybe we could take it from there. Okay. Uh, coming to Dr. Sangha's uh, questions. Uh, I mean, no, actually not questions. I think just regular clarifications over here. And uh, uh, thank you, Sangha, for having been a part of this session. It's always such a pleasure and a privilege to meet you. And for that extremely uh, generous introduction also for that matter, which again, like I said, I thoroughly, you know, don't deserve because, you know, I'm into academics, you're into academics, you know, it comes with the profession basically. So I always feel a little, you know, I just feel it's so undeserving when people say this, you know, I because it comes with the profession, you're supposed to be striving, you're supposed to be writing, translating, whatever, whatever, you know, so I, uh, I think you're, you and Dr. Rintani have been way, way too generous, you know, because we're all teachers. We're supposed to be doing that anyway. So anyhow, so, but uh, uh, I think you had three uh, specific, if I'm not mistaken, uh, aspects to uh, denote. And it's uh, the first one being with regards to the concept of language and also with women and where you had also spoken about the term Nukhoi and uh, which, Okay, I think employ in the context of, you know, what was said yesterday by the moderator and also in terms of, uh, you know, the poem that you had also written. And uh, also you had spoken about Kin Farm and, you know, the manner in which he had projected his mother also in the poem. Uh, I feel that this is extremely fascinating because right now I am uh, attempting a translation of, uh, you know, one of... Um, James Dokuma's text. And uh, I won't tell you all which one it is right now. Uh, I'm nearly coming to the end of it. And I am, you know, I, I'm hoping that it will be done by uh, next month. And uh, there, you know, the term Nukhoi has been used. And it's not only him, and it's not only, you know, people of say, uh, Dr. Sanga's generation, or, you know, it, it's generally, you know, it's almost as if to say that, this particular word, you know, this word in particular has been brought back time and again, I think, to remind each of ourselves, uh, male, whether male or female, about, you know, the kind of positions that, uh, you know, Mizos have in terms of uh, uh, the situatedness about gender, basically. We just have to, if a man says it, you know, uh, it's, 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 you know, it's about his own identity as a man. And to the woman that he says it to, and also to women who are not Nukhoi, who use that particular word. So, you know, it's got so many connotations also. Now, and, you know, so it's all about, you know, rather than the gender construct, uh, you know, it's all there. And rather than the vocabulary, 
vocabulary also. For me, it's always been a big in terms of identity per se. And, uh, you know, uh, they, uh, I do know, for example, that there would be women who are Nutloi and they themselves hate that particular word. Whereas, you know, if a woman like me makes that particular, uses that particular word, it has nothing to do with the derogatory connotation at any point of time. So sometimes, you know, I, and the same question is also in terms of uh, the other aspects also, you know, the kind of language that, uh, you know, say a woman ought to make or not or ought not to make. It, it's something like, you know, what I had said in terms of uh, men's conversation and women's gossip also for that matter. You know, who converses, who gossips also. Is it only the prerogative of the male to, to converse? And is it without, you know, when women, men, when men sit together, is it, you know, gossip for that matter? Am I a resource person and gossiping out to y'all and Sangha is over there having decent conversation? I mean, you know, it's, I find it as ridiculous as that sometimes, you know, but yes, these are very, very pivotal issues that we have to understand. But, you know, what I'm trying to say over here is I always tell, especially my research scholars, right from the word go not just not just the ones who are here uh, not just the ones who i'm you know supervising at this point of time but i've always been telling them and sometimes yes when i have an opportunity in the classroom i always tell people you know see when you talk about constructs whether it's language or whether it's aesthetics or just about anything you know ultimately it's all about identity you know, for me, it's all about identity. My projects have been, if you'll check out my projects, you know, I've I've always had this long lasting passionate affair with identity. And, you know, it always boils down to the kind of, and when I talk about identity, I'm trying to talk about it in the big fat umbrella sense of the word. And for me, it's always been about how secure one is and the kind of place and position that we all have in the world. If somebody said, you know, because, for example, I'll give you all a very small example, and I'm sure you'll have seen this, you would see many people uh, who would say, you know, who would feel that it's derogatory, not only for Nutloi, even for the term Patloi, for that matter. James Dokuma uses the word Nutloi, and he uses it. And, you know, I totally love the way he uses it over here, despite my reading of it, because, you know, if you knew James Dokuma, like the way I did, if you knew him as a person, you would know that he never meant to be sexist. But if you read it in a manner, you know, if you never conversed with him, and if you didn't trapeze around with him, like the way I did, you would totally say, because he's now dead, and gone, you would totally say, oh my God, I think we should get back his Padma Shri. He was so sexist. But you know, he it, it was ne it's never that way. You think it's sexist, but it's not. You have to look at the identity, the power and the persona of that particular man. And for me also, it's that way. It really doesn't matter. Even if somebody comes and said, you know, Margaret can't speak a word of English. I know I can speak English. So it really totally, I, it totally wouldn't bother me. So it's something as simplistic as that perhaps. So in his, in this particular text that I'm using, uh, that I'm doing, he uses the term patloi, and patloi especially because they are the people who, you know, he, it's almost tantamount to pasaltra, which is ridiculous because, you know, pasaltra is not patloi, we know that, right? But you, it's almost ridiculous, and, you know, nutloi also, but I have, in this translation, like I have done with the other translations, because I want that, you know, there be a cultural uh, trans, uh, transaction somewhere, it's like how I keep puan puan, it's like how I keep, you know, M M. I have deliberately, and I'm hoping when my publishers uh, get onto it, that they will allow me to retain this, and if they don't, I'm really to fight for it, I have used the term Nutloi as Nutloi. Because if you try to translate Nutloi, and you know, what is it? You know, if you go back to all the dictionaries that you have, Mizo to English, English to Mizo, you know, it says, uh, it talks about the divorcee. Whereas it's actually not that, and the patloi also, even the patloi, they say that it's a middle-aged man. Now, middle-aged men, all middle-aged, I know a lot of, I'm middle-aged, I know a lot of middle-aged men, and they wouldn't want to be called patloi, for heaven's sake. So, you know, it's, so I have retained the term uh, patloi, and also nutloi, for that matter, in that particular concept. And I, as a Mizo translator, I, as a Mizo writer, would not want that it is derogatory. And always my advice to my students also is that, 
even if you are actually nucleoid or patloid, please, the important thing is don't get that complex and get hyped up because somebody says you are nucleoid, patloid, because it's a tag. It's actually a cultural tag, which is which comes with it. And the more you react, you know, the more you you embolden the tag to manifest and it, you know, suddenly it becomes a, a really negative connotation. Also about the mm, the language that women are supposed to use and not use. Again, this I think is again something that comes with the gender dynamics uh, tag. You know, I was watching this show uh, the other day. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I uh, I don't know how many of you all watch it. It's that uh, it's the Jimmy Kimmel live show, and you know, and uh, so uh, he had people getting out, and this is in. Um, New York. So he had people getting out. I mean, and I'm talking about New York because, you know, it's like everybody is like, oh, this cannot even happen in New York. So he had people getting out with mics and they were being filmed and they were little children. And they said, you know, can your mother ever say a bad word? And, you know, and, uh, you know, and they had done a poll. They had done a poll before that and many people, and this is America, mind you, and this is not even, these are not even Mormons and they're not even back or beyond at any point of time. And many people said, no, I don't think she should. And even if she should, I don't think it's going to be done in public. But they called out these little, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, these children and they were just down the president and they said, does your mother ever swear? What's the worst word that your mother has said to you? And some of them, you know, were, you know, the F words also. And people were like, oh my goodness, does your mother says that does your dad and then you know and the children were like see when my dad says it's it's okay but you know after that my mom says it but sometimes she says she's sorry I think it's almost like you're, you're you know you're apologetic for using that language does it add to your lingo does it add to your temperament for whatever it is I think that this is something that is not just there as a part of say the northeast I know Sangha didn't mean that, but uh, you know, it's there everywhere. It's culturally in a way accepted that you have to be nice. You have to be, as a woman, you have to do this. And also that, um, uh, you know, that coming to that question about, you know, the celebration of ugliness and uh, uh, males and masculinity also for that matter, um, that's ugliness for that matter. I find it very fascinating again, because if you do, a comparative study between folk and fairy lore. Uh, we know that we just have the folklore. We don't have fairy lore out over here um, and good for us in a way. But, uh, you know, if you do the European ethos of the fairy lore, you've got beautiful people, like I said. And, you know, it's not just Prince, it's Prince Charming. Let's remind ourselves, you know, it's Prince Charming. So what is he going to do? He has to be charming. And you know, there's and there's a fairy godmother also. And you know, and what is the and the most famous, the celebrated wave of the wand, and you know, you've got a lovely gown and you've got glass slippers also. I, I mean, and you know, it's I find it frightening, you know, that a woman could actually be made to stand on glass slippers. She seemed to be mature enough because she got married to the prince also. That, you know, that you ought to have this and then especially the Barbie doll projections also for that matter. That's a different paradigm altogether. But, you know, you grew up with these fairy tales. A woman is there, there's Cinderella. And, you know, what happens today? We're saying things like, oh, a job will change my life. But, you know, what changed her life was a glass slipper having a new shoe basically changed her life. And she stood on that glass slipper. It was all about, you know, the West is where we get all this from. It's important that we localize and we, you know, we and accept that aspect of our culture because, and I don't understand, remember that I think two days back, all thanks and no thanks to the boundary issue also. Uh, there was this video that went viral and then somebody said, what's there in that, your truck? And then that man said, cosmetics. And we had a minister actually tweeting and saying that there was one uh, truckload of cosmetics that came. And I was saying, you know, but I had ordered for Mars and I had ordered for my nephew's textbooks. I wish I had labeled them under cosmetics. But anyway, that's a joke. But anyway, for whatever it takes, what I'm trying to say over here is I don't understand why there is so much of, uh, you know, why there is so much of a prominence that is being made to cosmetics out over here, whether it's for the male or whether it's for the female. And unfortunately, it was the LGBTQ community that was being targeted. And people said that, you know, they alone would be using the cosmetics. I think it's mean also in a way. Um, it could be true, but it's mean also so you know suddenly 
you know, we have come to a stage where suddenly we say things like uh, women should be dressing up more because like I said, there was that celebration of remain hoi, like I told you. We all knew, just, it was just a long hair. There was nothing about the beauty part of it. As for people like say Pahakata and Pordumbela, it was all about, you know, they were so ugly. But again, that important thing also about, you know, how it's your good looks that fetches you a wife, because they said, because they were so ugly, they did not get a wife. It was so sad. And, you know, but, uh, but that is what I like about, uh, you know, the concept of aesthetics, which is not too celebrated. Now, of course, we're going totally overboard, but that's a different topic altogether. But it, and but what happens out over there is uh, here is that again coming back to you know that very pivotal point about this seminar or webinar which is on gender uh, you, while you celebrate pasaltra you know we all know what the pasaltra does uh, and while you celebrate pasaltra we also have turbura we have to remind ourselves that this is a culture that's also celebrating turbura and today we still celebrate turbura and you know, we use Surbura in so many ways. And uh, some people say he's a fool. Some people say he's a trickster. Some people even say he's wise. For me, you know, uh, I don't know too much about the wisdom, but uh, Surbura culturally has always represented foolishness in terms of the ethos. So why make him wise? I always say he wouldn't want to be wise. You know, he would get, if he ever came back, you know, if he ever came back to 21st century, he would be meeting Dr. Shekima, you know, going into mental depression because he said, actually, I was meant to be a fool. I, I, why do we have to paint them in so many colors? Because you see, that is exactly what, you know, you read something, Homi Baba says hybridity, and suddenly we're all hybrid and putting on makeup. I, sometimes I feel it's actually not, it's, it's unfair, isn't it? I mean, what we try, the lengths that we go to. And also, uh, and the same thing also, not only with Mizo, uh, and then we're also celebrating the Pasaltra, like I said, but you're also celebrating Sam Dala. Remember, he was so lazy. I mean, he's the epitome of laziness. He, he actually sat, uh, lay down under the fig tree. He opened his mouth in the hope that a fig, tree, a fig would fall. So we celebrate. This is a culture that celebrates Sam Dala. And sometimes I think way too often for that matter. But anyway, we celebrate Sam Dala. And, you know, and there's the Pasaltra also. So we've got myriad aspects in terms of gender. Whereas in the West, I think it would have been really a tough especially on Prince Charming, who had to wear, who had to be, by the way, knight in shining armor also. Uh, he had to slay the dragon. And I always feel that there would have been a Prince Charming out there who would have been scared of a cockroach. I mean, if cockroaches were around at that point of time, but this man was trained to slay the dragon. So he had to, he, he had to be performing, you know, basically. As for the women also, they got less opportunities, I feel, than the women that we have in our cultures because our women can do so much more. Orality, post-colonial, for whatever it is, they can do so much more. Because the women just had this particular aspect of, you know, you've got to have long hair, you've got to have, unless your fairy godmother rescues you, you're just out there like Cinderella out there in the cinders. And then, you know, and happily ever after. In meso uh, orality and also the post-colonial, a lot in terms of the post-colonial, what I totally like in terms of our gender paradigm is I find them tough, both the genders, and you don't have a happily ever after. Usually our, our stories are happily never after. And I find that so real life because, you know, if you, uh, and I've asked this in the class also, and even if I don't ask, it's very crucial that we understand that we live in a world where the happily ever afters are the things that we strive for. But even if there are happily never afters, we still survive. I think that is what, you know, the gender dynamics of misocultural ethos uh, basically teaches us. Uh, Dr. Sangha, uh, if you could check uh, the chat box, there is actually a question that is directed to you. Um, I can read it out, or if you can read it by yourself, uh, I think you can address yeah, Please that. read it out. Okay. Um, how do we break down the barriers between academia and practice? You mentioned the frustration at a lack of movement and awareness of certain issues and topics, and how people jump to conclusions 
through social media influencers comment. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Why just me though? I think like I think even Professor Margaret's take on this would be absolutely interesting. <laughs> but anyway, okay. I'll just uh, attempt at this first. I think like I've actually said it uh, within my uh, little talk there as well. Is the fact that uh, we as ac ac oh, academicians, sorry, we have to learn. Uh, th th there's this thing that I've said that I'm missing as well. The disconnect is the fact that we do not know how to translate it into our culture. The translation of culture is very, very important. It's not just the translation of the language of the meaning from English to Mizo of whatever, or from whatever language to just us. It's not enough to have the language there, the words there to say, oh, it is this defined like this as according to this person, right? So the cultural uh, translation has to be there as well as to where we can etern internalize it. And that is very, very, uh, and that is the trick, that is the onus, the onus, like I say, is on us. That is the work that we have as academicians to be able to do that, to be able to translate that, right? That's the first thing. And secondly, again, like I said, the literature, to, for those of you who write, for example, like how are you going to deal with these things? Uh, because that influences, that educates, and that basically leads a lot of people to thinking a certain way. And But it has to be, see, a lot of it has to be on our terms, right? So the thing is like, uh, it has to be on our terms. And we have to figure out a way how to translate that to make it from within our terms. Uh, and also the last part where I said about, uh, you know, how we just jump straight to D without going through the ABCs. Again, that is how we have to, uh, uh, that is where we have to be able to make more and more people understand that, you know, uh, where the argument stems from and, and the fact that we are, we belong to a different, uh, we, we belong to a different cultural timeline as opposed to the others, right? So the thing is like understanding that difference, I think is very, very important and keep educating people about that difference is also very important. And also understanding that there are their arguments or criticism most of the times, as much as I've read and seen and I've heard and listened to has always been within their timeline, their time frame. They are at a specific space in time culturally now where they can talk about those things without really discrediting uh, what has come before it, but just what it has grown into, right? but we are still at those foundational stages where we're still talking about these things. So therefore that argument is not for us right now, so to say, but uh, more importantly, you can't use that argument to dismiss the entire thing properly or to entirely rather. So I think in those ways, you can make uh, those, uh, you can bridge those gaps. At least that's what I think. I hope I'm making sense. Okay, I'll just swiftly move on to the next question. Uh, this is actually the first question which I received uh, from a valued participant. Uh, she has been an active participant. I think it's okay to mention her name, Dr. Kukui from Patsume University College. Um, this is a question that uh, she had uh, raised. How different is the portrayal of gender in pre and post-colonial Mizo narratives? I think uh, both ma'am and uh, Dr. Sanger can and so how different is the portrayal this. of gender in pre and post colonial <clears throat> meso narratives? Sangha, would you like to go first? No, no, please, you do this. Uh, you, you're the expert on this. I'm, I'm hardly the expert here, <laughs> but uh, let me try and uh, uh, put it this way because I haven't. Uh, Orality, I can uh, understand, but you know, in terms of the post-colonial, basically, uh, because I haven't, obviously, because there's a huge corpus now, as we know, and we uh, and I haven't read the entire corpus. So let me just try and be, uh, uh, you know, generalized, basically. And since I'm obviously not from the field of Mizo literature, uh, but uh, here, uh, because I'm strictly trying to stick to the narratives, uh, the literary narratives uh, out over here. So... I think that, uh, you know, what I feel is, like I have mentioned in my presentation, uh, in, uh, in the PowerPoint presentation, I actually feel that uh, the post-colonial is uh, something that's making us slide, slightly backwards. And uh, there's this, you know, it's a reverse paradigm shift. It's, it's something which is not uh, making us uh, 
climb upwards. It's something that's uh, you know making us very very uh, uh, you know it's not something the narratives are not things which make us very inclusive uh, about not only gender but also other aspects also uh, meso narratives in particular. I feel that uh, you know for whatever that we have in terms of the oral narratives and uh, the reason as to why I also said that uh, you know over the oral narratives, not because I've translated them, but uh, where, you know, I feel so much more secure is because, you know, the entire corpus, I think we all know, uh, is something that had been uh, relegated to the background and something that, especially the song paradigm, we know that, uh, you know, when the missionaries came, because of that uh, threat of insecurity, we know that, you know, a lot of songs were done away with. So you have a lot of our narratives surviving, mainly because, you know, they took on the form of, say, elementary readers. We know that, you know, Pinotsungi had uh, collaborated uh, in the South and she collaborated with the missionaries and then, you know, so we're able to get a smattering of that. But even what we have of the prose is something that was bereft of the actual, uh, you know, the, of the actual. So uh, so whatever that we have, you know, I've been, we've, I think uh, not only me, I think all of us, we would have been able to read it through the archives and through, you know, oral, uh, 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 orally transmitted tales and stuff like that. So. Uh, I'm very confident that, you know, our oral tales are things that, uh, like I had pointed out, uh, which had they gone on at that particular tangent would have actually made us much more male, female, much more emancipated. This is what I totally feel. Because you see, even though we say that, you know, the, ma the male had a place and the female had a place, you know, in, uh, it, it, you know, they... Everything was, you know, there's a time there was a place for everything. And, uh, you know, there were people who were thoroughly accountable to what they were supposed to do. There was no hodgepodge about it. I feel that, you know, if we had gone on that tangent and ultimately came to narratives where women would step out of the house and men would step into the house, perhaps as homemakers also at some point of time, I feel that the roles would have been, even if there were role reversals, it would have been just really beautiful. Because orality brought about, you know, in the Mizo tradition, orality brought about a sense of professionalism to everything. And, you know, so uh, this is what I find really beautiful. And uh, what I also don't, uh, uh, and, but what happens is, you know, when the, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, when uh, things were uh, in, in terms of the post-colonial, when we started having writers, the first three, the, the writers that I had mentioned in my text, their writings are on a totally different tangent altogether. And one of the writers also who I did not mention, Casey Lalvunga. Uh, his writing is actually on, it's on a totally different dimension altogether. And I totally love it because, you know, it's on a totally different tangent altogether. But the writers that we have today uh, are, you know, people that, uh, uh, you know, I have read. I haven't read their entire corpus. They write really well, I'm quite sure. Some of them have gone on to, you know, get the uh, Mizo Academy of Letters Awards. And some of them we've worked with in translation workshops also. Some of them, my own research scholars are working. So uh, thanks to them, I'm getting to read them also for that matter. But I just feel that, uh, you know, um, I don't know. And as, uh, uh, Dr. Sama can correct me on this. I just feel that sometimes that, you know, there is that a decided sense of insecurity that has stepped in to both genders, perhaps, and maybe perhaps predominantly towards the male. I really wouldn't know why. Maybe it is because, you know, at certain points of time, independent of literature, we would have uh, women performing on a much more better scale, professionally, academically also. And maybe perhaps because the male you know, decides to, find refuge in terms of writing, maybe poems or, you know, songs or novels also for that matter. And then perhaps, you know, so what happens is, you know, when writing is something like that, you know, it's extremely personal. I think we all know about that, whether it's academic writing or, or fictional writing or whether it is non-fictional. So we tend to write and we tend to vent out, let me put it this way, in the manner that we feel or think. And uh, especially if we are extremely honest to what we are committing ourselves to.
And if we're not, you know, like uh, uh, if we're not, then we can always look at, you know, blogs and vlogs and, uh, you know, their social media. That is why we have fiber connection. We have, you know, we have uh, a whole lot of internet connectivity out over here to just Google and, uh, you know, emulate somebody's life for the heck of it. So I'm not going on that tangent, which is, which is well, hardly worth deliberating upon, but which I think lots of us are doing. But, you know, if you're very honest to what you're writing, you actually vent out or you write in the manner that you feel or speak or uh, towards aspects, towards issues that you basically feel for. And I think that is what comes out in the writing today. And uh, I, as a translator also, and as an academic, I find it uh, that uh, it's very difficult, especially to uh, I, I, I don't, I don't have to be apologetic at all. But uh, I, I find it extremely difficult to work with uh, male writers because they always tell me that you know I, somehow you know they always tell me. You, I've written this particular, but it's not worth translating. Don't even read it. I mean, it's almost as if to say, I'm going to translate it and distort the whole thing, you know, and, and then they'll say things like, you know, but when you ask me for a particular word, I will know the meaning. Ha, you know, as in, that is what translation is all about. I mean, if we had to ask the author about the word and they knew, I mean, what is the role of the translator? But whereas, whereas when you talk, and, but you know, and this is what happens. Because we have, especially in Mizo uh, culture, we have more males who are writing and good for them. I'm happy. Look at the entire corpus. I mean, look at Mizo Academy of Letters. And, and I mean, look at the whole Jingbang. I mean, it's, it's the males out over there and I, we're happy for them. Of course, you do find, uh, you know, and there's Masomik Jacob clinging almost very apologetically and, you know, and uh, to somewhere out over there. And well, just about it. Uh, people like us, we're not even considered writers. At best, they'll call us translators. And, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> well, I teach in the Department of English. If I don't know English, what am I supposed to do? So almost as if to say it's a compliment. So, and then, you know, but what happens out over here is um, there are male, more males who are writing and it's a projection of their uh, perception of the world the perception of the world and gender and a whole lot of other things. And this is what we get. These are the people who are getting the Mizo Academy of Letters. Sang, I'm so sorry. I wish you had responded to this. <laughs> you should respond to it again also later on because you're writing, you're a male, you're a Mizo, you should be responding. But, uh, you know, but women, there are very, there are fewer women that who are writing. And, you know, always when I've been to workshops, like, you know, I uh, when I go to workshops outside of Mizoram also with them, uh, once I had the opportunity to go, there was like this very, uh, there was like this very who's who list. I must have been the only one who was not a who's who out over there. I was like, who is that? kind of thing if there, if there was a who's that list that would have been me, but the rest of the Jingbang was the who's who list. And there was this woman who was, uh, you know, a, 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 a writer, and she was so apologetic throughout, and uh, she she kept saying, you know, I shouldn't be here, and I don't know what I'm doing here, but she was really good, and it was not as if to say the males put her down, but that's the kind of attitude that we all have, so like I said, it all boils down to your identity, your insecurity, and if women are projected, I just feel that the um, you know, because it, see, in orality, it was not that way. Males said exactly what they had to say and women said exactly what they had to say. Nobody taught them to think. Nobody said you should not be saying this. But uh, uh, we are in that crossfire basically. But uh, what I appreciate about the writing out over here today is that uh, I think we're all being very, very, in a way, decidedly honest also. And that is one very good trait that I have realized of uh, Mizo writers, especially, and also of the Mizo community. Uh, you know, because if uh, males project a woman this way, or a woman says this about the male, uh, then it's it's all in all honesty. 
I don't think we hate each other or, you know, we, we uh, tomorrow I'm not going to start, you know, getting onto my placards and I'm not going to go on a slogan campaign and stuff like that. But, but you know, that's exactly what we feel. So, but like I said, going back to the question, it's all about, uh, I just always feel that uh, women were definitely more emancipated and uh, men also for that matter. There was so much of an objectivity to orality. And I wish that we didn't keep them, you know, just atop the fire shelves once in a while to lull our children to sleep. Because I think that we need to get back that strength that was there at that point of time, minus the theory, minus all the cancel culture and minus everything that is out here today. Uh, so and generally, this is what I feel. Uh, Dr. Sanga, would you like to comment further as a male Mizo writer? <laughs> all right. Okay. Oh, a couple of things. I, I think like ma'am basically just really covered all that really well, but more, more of an observation as far as Google's uh, uh, question is concerned about the post-colonial, uh, pre-colonial, post-colonial uh, question, uh, colonization rather. But I always found that, uh, you know, with the folk tales like ma'am has put, uh, is this, uh, again, uh, I can't really generalize because then there are always like these little gems that you find every now and then, but normally in and in the large swath. Um, <clears throat> I find that like, you know, with our folk tales, they're deliciously more original. I say deliciously so. Uh, like you, you, they're, they're so strange, some of them. Like, you know, you, you, you end up thinking like, what are they trying to teach with this? But there's no such thing like you, you like Mama said. There's no happily ever after. Sometimes there isn't. There doesn't seem to be a rhyme or reason for the things that as they proceed. Sometimes, like you know, they just happen. And like there's there's a yeah, there's such a delicious originality and creativity about that, which I think we missed after a certain point of time because of again what has come in with Christianity. You know, the Victorian values that were imparted along with that as well. So it, eventually, it became like a. It became like this. Uh, so writing more than just creative, it became almost like a moral uh, responsibility that you have to teach an entire swath of people like this. That so there's always that desire to be either too profound or to to try to teach too didactic and all of that, right? So that so it loses a little bit of like you know that deliciousness of the unexpected of like you know not knowing what is happening and all of that. So but then again, like I said, again one or two again pop up that completely changes my mind again like uh, especially when it, uh, when i speak in realms of poetry for example modern younger poets especially the way they write is again completely different and amazing the way they are they write and it really gives you hope for the future and all that now as far as the uh, difference in sexes between the writers uh, in the mizo language perhaps like in the mizo language perhaps there is that great uh, you know discrepancy between the male writers and the female writers. But strangely enough, when you look at, I think even Mizoram and even Nagaland as well, when it comes to writing in English and poetry, mm. I've always realized there are more women than men, female than male that writes. I wonder why that is. You, uh, probably it's because like, you know, there is the less, there is lesser of a, because there is like this great, uh, this great, um, but notion that women are the custodians of a certain thing, or maybe like men feel like the way that they are, you know, the custodians of the language, perhaps maybe. So maybe women do not feel like you know, uh, they 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 that that their that is their space. So they find instead a foreign language where they can express themselves. I don't know. Again, these are just like questions that we can have and discuss. On. Okay, um, in line with our dis uh, like, there is a there is a comment uh, from one of our YouTube viewers uh, in line with our discussion, uh, the discussion that we're currently having. I'll just uh, read this out in order to boost our further boost our thinking uh, on that very topic. Uh, she has said, with the advent of Christianity, the folk tales were altered to cater to the newly constructed Christian identity. That's what um, I want. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't think we can, uh, we, we have time to further comment on this. I'll just move on to the last question uh, that uh, we received from uh, one of our participants, Dr. Jamie from uh, Patsuma University College. Uh, she has said, Dr. Margaret has talked about 
the all encompassing nature of gender that it focuses both on male and female. Right? Is there a necessity to focus more in men power in men empowerment rather than women today in the Mizo community? Because the male community are lagging behind in every field of work, and yet the general attitude of the male is still very domineering. So uh, if we can both add um, a short analysis or comment on this question, uh, this will be the last question that uh, we can address because I think we're almost approaching four o'clock and it would be too um, straining on your part to <laughs> sit for that long. So I would like to invite both of you to address this question. Sang, I think you should take this first. Okay, uh, for me, uh, very, very shortly and sweetly, uh, uh, again, uh, yesterday they, they spoke something uh, of, uh, they touched on an issue that was, I think, very, very important as well, where they spoke about how uh, feminism, uh, about how patriarchy is also equally as, uh, can be equally as toxic and as bad for men as it is for women as well. How it also, like, you know, uh, uh, holds us to certain standards, how it stops us from being a certain way, how it uh, doesn't let us develop properly because of all these uh, uh, rules as to what we're supposed to be as well. So I think like uh, in answer to that question, perhaps I think like we need to take that approach as well to understand how harmful that uh, patriarchy is to uh, men as well as it is to women. So just, I think like, yeah, shortly uh, continue from what was said yesterday. I think I'll just say that. Professor Margaret? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I think again, you have to look at uh, here, it's something that is again, uh, not just narratives basically, that is, you know, it's not just your folklore, it's not just uh, post-colonial narratives, but your narratives in general about life that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, we ought to look at. And one of the, and you know, unfortunately, the irony about, uh, it's a beautiful question, I appreciate it. Uh, the irony about this whole thing is that, you know, if uh, we had, I always feel that uh, if we had a public, a reading public, you know, like the kind you started out with in the 18th century, uh, you know, because uh, assuming that we're all, you know, students of literature out over here, if we all, if Mizos, for example, because it's something that is pertinent, the question is pertinent to the Mizo. If the Mizo community, and I'm not talking about literacy out over here, I know that we're highly literate and all that, and we're proud of it, but I'm talking about the reading public in general out over here, both male and female. If we were uh, an, an observing uh, and a very committed reading public, I think uh, this whole thing about, you know, uh, trying to, uh, you know, trying to get out in terms of patriarchy or the parochial aspect, trying to bring in more of an emancipation would actually, you know, that uh, uh, at least more than half of it would totally go. This is what I feel. Because, you know, because, since we're talking about narratives, because uh, the reading culture is something that, uh, you know, brings that element of emancipation. The more that a culture reads uh, is, you know, the more you have, uh, uh, you know, not only the development of the intellect, but you also have differing kinds of perspectives. The problem in the society today is because uh, we do not have perspectives or we do not allow perspectives that are differing to enter into our comfort zones at any point of time. We just feel that, uh, you know, uh, it has to be this and can be it just has to be left and it cannot be right. It has to be black, it cannot be white, stuff like that. So, you know, we don't allow for, uh, let's just say an interdisciplinary aspect of thinking. We don't allow too many perspectives to come into our, uh, you know, into uh, to seep into our intellect. And this, I'm not just talking in terms of the academia, I'm talking about, you know, Mizos at large out over here on Mars, uh, who's out there in the rural aspects, out here in the, in 
in the urban, just about everyone, the educated, the semi-educated, the literate, the semi-literate, just about everyone. But we're just so happy, you know, spouting quotations and spouting the kind of ideologies perhaps, which our forefathers or our, you know, or uh, just about somebody on the internet might even be posting without even bothering to understand or without even bothering to uh, question as to whether it has any viability within our own culture. Is it something which is very important? And also how practical would it be in that particular ethos? I just feel that, for example, that, you know, things like feminism, uh, you don't really have to fight so much for it at this point of time, let's say in our culture, at least within a certain ambit. But there are people who would like to, who would love to fight about it and feel that uh, they are projecting, uh, you know, that they are suppressed and very oppressed also, and perhaps they are. But sometimes, you know, it's just out here. You don't, uh, you know, it's just out here. You, you don't really get into the practicalities of things. And, uh, and men also, you know, like I said, you know, when you talk to men and you ask them about their books, suddenly, you know, they fight shy. You hardly find people like Sanga out over here. And I don't mean this, you know, I'm not, I would have said this anyway, even if you were not here, if we had logged off and left the meeting, but, you know, I would have said this, but, uh, you know, you don't find too many people like that. You have to have that sense of security about you, about your own work. You're winning them. You, you're winning the, um, a prestigious prize, the MAL award, the book of the year. And you, and you know, there are men also who feel terribly, terribly insecure. I, you know, I have to hand this over to them uh, because while well, Jamie's question said that, you know, there was a certain level of pomposity, which is actually very, very true also, but you actually have a different set also who actually feel otherwise. And uh, I also feel that, uh, yes, there has to be, a, the, you know, you, and that uh, factor about, uh, like I had said again, that sense of honesty that you had earlier on, much earlier on, and hopefully, you know, and it hasn't died down as such, that ought to actually come back also. Uh, women, men also, like uh, uh, Sama had also pointed out, you know, more women write poetry. It's actually because, especially in the Mizo ethos, as far as I have asked, especially the males who, you know, the men who write uh, novels, or novelas or even good articles also, they always feel it's a woman's domain. Why? Because it's about emotions. And they always say that, you know, I can't write because people will be laughing at me. You know, people would be laughing at me. Have we ever laughed at William Wordsworth for that matter? Never. Must be laughing all the way to the bank by now. Look at the amount of Ramji Lals that are stacked up in his name also. If at all there's anything to laugh about William Wordsworth, it's the bank account that he must be laughing at. Now, so, you know, and uh, so there is a decided sense of insecurity also. We must also have that sense of honesty. If a woman can do something better, and the male has to be out there being a homemaker for that matter, it's fine. And again, I also feel that uh, about women also, you know, sometimes we are obviously our own worst enemies. We always say things like, oh, she's just a housewife. I always find, you know, we just say she's just a housewife. What does your mother, my father was in the army, but my mother is just a housewife. What is just a housewife? And, you know, today, especially the term housewife, nobody uses it anymore, at least academically and politically correct terminologies. When I sit on, you know, uh, uh, vivas for that matter, I'm always telling them, you know, the terminology that is accepted is now is a homemaker. There's nothing like, you know, just a housewife. I find that there are many women who are doing research and uh, and you know they i mean not in our department uh, because uh, thank the good Lord, you know, the, the syllabus doesn't afford them that luxury. So, you know, in other departments who are doing uh, research and they're talking about, you know, women who are just housewives and these are coming from women themselves. It's appalling. And, you know, this is what, you know, when and women also must back up women, not just for the sake of backing up, but yes, because, you know, if you feel that uh, the husband or the male figure has to come out and uh, support the women, we must understand that 
you know, somebody who's much more stronger at that point of time, especially in terms of the gender dynamic, if you feel that a woman is stronger, back up the other women for that matter. And, you know, that gives you that sense of power. It levels out things. It doesn't, it doesn't give you a happily ever after ending. I told you that only happens in fairy tales, which is why I said we don't have fairy tales in Mizo society because we don't have the happily ever after. But it levels things out to a very great extent. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your valuable input. Um, I just would like to mention that uh, there are a number of active uh, YouTube viewers uh, who have also contributed their views and their questions uh, through the uh, chat box on YouTube. I sincerely wish uh, you, you know, we would have more time to address all those comments and questions. And I also, uh, I saw very recently, uh, especially one of the uh, active participants uh, who is a little frustrated because we are not able to address any of the questions that webinar series now. Um, sadly, uh, with that, uh, we have come to the end of our three days national webinar series on gender and culture. Uh, once again, on behalf of the Department of English and Women's Cell Government City College, uh, we thank our, first of all, our esteemed principal, P.C. Lil for being extremely supportive and open and, uh, you know, in helping us uh, in organizing this event. Uh, we extend our sincere gratitude to all our resource persons. Uh, from the first day, Dr. Christina Azama and Dr. Sizo Tanmoya. Uh, second day, we had uh, Ms. Kritika Sharma and Ms. Alalmal Somi. And today, uh, as we have all witnessed, um, we have two exceptional uh, speakers again. Uh, so uh, we're extremely grateful um, to all of our resource persons and our invited guests, and also uh, to all the participants who have valued our program and stayed with us throughout. Thank you for blessing us with an unforgettable and extraordinary experience. And I'm certain that all of us who are here as listeners uh, today and on the previous days have benefited greatly from the talk and the discussions. And I'm sure that we will be leaving this program with an enriched mind. And uh, we truly appreciate our speakers today once again, and uh, the ones we have had before for the incredible ride that you took us on. But as they say, all good things must come to an end. Uh, so we say thank you with a grateful and an indebted heart. Uh, thank you for committing to this event to make it a success. Thank you so much. And I think with that, uh, we can end our webinar uh, for today. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you to all our participants uh, who are here uh, joining us from outside, apart from the students. Thank you all. Thank you.